Welcome to this virtual service of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Waynesboro. Today is the second Sunday of Advent, a season of intentional waiting. But we've already been forced into long waiting for many months now. The waiting and preparation that we usually plan for and plan around feels very different this December. But just as we have learned how to adapt to the challenges that the pandemic has brought us, now we are learning how to do this holiday season in a different way. During these months, we have found clever ways to come together while apart. How to virtually or by distancing share our ideas, hopes, and dreams with our friends and loved ones. So, too, let us approach these holidays with joy, gratefulness, and creativity in spite of the frustrations and disappointments that may at times be present. This congregation seeks to embody the welcome that the seasonal stories and scriptures make central. We recognize that each person is as significant as a whole world of possibility and that every identity group and characteristic is enriching to all of us. The Advent Carol says, Love, the guest, is on the way. Each one is worthy of a warm family welcome and a welcome worthy of someone of great respect and importance. Race, ethnicity, gender, sexual and affectional orientation, career path, economic class, political outlook, all these identity characteristics bring with them experiences and perspectives that will enrich the entire community when they are honored fully. We bid you welcome to this Advent service and to our fellowship. I am Susan Clark, and I am happy to be welcoming you today. If this is your first visit with us, we hope you will visit us virtually again. And when the conditions allow us to be together in reality in our wonderful building, in Waynesboro, that you will visit us in person. We would love to get to know you. Now, let us kindle the chalice of our hearts with these words by David Breeden. <clears throat> in this holiday season, may the darkness of winter be dispelled in this festival of lights. And may the darkness of ignorance be dispelled in the strength of compassion, reason, and sharing. This morning marks the second Sunday in the season of Advent. In the Christian tradition, Advent is the beginning of the church year, recognizing the transforming power of God in the world and looking forward toward the birth of Jesus and the celebration of spiritual light. Christianity is not alone in celebrating light at this time of year. Hanukkah, solstice, and Kwanzaa all involve candles, fire, and lights as part of their celebrations. Each week until Christmas, we light a new candle on the Advent wreath. The circle of greenery reminds us of the eternal cycle of all life without beginning or end. And the candles remind us that we are each called to emit our glow 
amid the pain and suffering facing our world. The light of Advent grows brighter and brighter, guiding us toward personal peace, shared joy, and more love. This morning, we light the second candle. We light this candle as a symbol of our longing for peace. We bring our hope into the world when we practice peacemaking. Our caring community aspires to be a source of freedom from violence and exclusion. As June Jordan writes, may we become the ones we have been waiting for. Together, may we strive to create a lasting peace. Saturday morning, 10 a.m. by Jan Richardson. Justice and peace meet at the cafe, sit together, hands folded around steaming cups, heads bent over the paper. They are not taking in the news of the world with sorrowing eyes and clucking tongues. They are instead planning their itinerary, plotting their map, looking for the places where they might slip in. Their fingers touch, release, touch again as they read, moving with half-aware habits that only come with long living alongside. They have met parted, met again on countless mornings like this one, torn and taken by turns. They put the paper aside, they brush away the crumbs, they talk quietly. They know there is work to do, but they order one more cup. There is savoring they must do, before the saving begins. They lean in, barely cut, touching across the table for a kiss that makes a way a world.
Our words of prayer today are by Kenneth Langer. Let me find peace within so that I may be calm throughout. Let me find silence within so that I may find compassion throughout. Let me be reminded that some things are worth waiting for. Let me be reminded that the journey is more important than reaching the destination. Let me see that the non-doing is as much a part of life as the doing. Let me be reminded that it is in these moments of holding on that I can find quietude and renewal. It is within these times of inaction that I can find rest. It is in these times of emptiness that I can become full. Each week as we gather, we bear together the sorrows and the joys of our entire fellowship community. So let us now hold unspoken joys together in our hearts quietly.
Hello, I'd like to read you News of the Infinite by Gary Kowalski. As if he was lonesome in his hut on Walden Pond, our neighbor Henry Thoreau famously replied, How could I be lonely? Don't I live in the Milky Way? Thoreau doubtless would have been encouraged by the recent discovery of Kepler-22, a planet just 600 light years from Earth, right in the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, but a balmy 72 degrees on the surface, just right for organic chemistry to flourish. It's just one of 139 potentially habitable worlds sighted since the Kepler spacecraft started looking for them a couple of years ago. And given the size of our galaxy, there are almost certainly billions of others. Life is probably widespread in our universe, scientists now agree. But back when I was a boy, a famous experiment produced amino acids the building blocks of proteins, by flashing an electric spark through a beaker of ammonia, methane, oxygen, excuse me, hydrogen, and water vapor, thought to be the primitive components of Earth's atmosphere. The theory was that long ago, a lucky lightning struck in a shallow pond produced the first protoplasm. But now we know that amino acids are everywhere in the tails of comets and in the dust of interstellar space. Wherever conditions are right, evolution takes off. And conditions are right all over, not just on places like Enceladus, a moon of Saturn, where liquid water has been proven present in geysers. Many cosmologists agree that the cosmos appears propitiously suited to life right down to the fundamental constants that govern gravity and allow stars and planets to form at all. Of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that the universe was designed for beings like us, but it does put a new twist on old legends, like the Christmas star. Does it really matter whether a nova appeared over, over Bethlehem all those years ago? For me, the real wonder is that we are all born out of stars, every molecule in our bodies forged in the furnaces of the heavens. What this means is that we humans belong here. We are not just accidental tourists in this world. We have grown out of time and space as naturally as grass pushes up through city sidewalks, and we are linked to nature not only in our biology, but in our minds and spirits also, which conceive space probes like Kepler and seem eternally fascinated by the big questions of where we come from and where we fit into the greater scheme. Who cares whether astronomers find another habitable planet anyway? it would take 22 million years for our fastest rockets to reach Kepler-22, not even figuring in all the pit stops. But the answer is people care. For beyond the business cycle, the election cycle, and other ephemeral headlines, human beings remain creatures hungry for news of the infinite. And for me, at least, it is satisfying to know not only that we live in the Milky Way, in some important sense, the Milky Way in all its brilliance and unfathomable extent also lives in us. That was News of the Infinite by Gary Kowalski.
Back in March, Warner Brothers Television shut down production on the fantasy series Supernatural due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The series had been wildly successful. It was in its final season after 15 years of production. But it went on hiatus after the March 23rd episode. It then resumed airing on October 8th, and the series finale aired on November 19th, just 10 days before the beginning of Advent. It was ironic that the final season was headed full tilt into a fictional annihilation event when it had to pause for COVID, a global disease that has killed around 275,000 people in the U.S. alone and has threatened and achieved much greater destruction. Supernatural is the story of two young adult brothers who grew up in a family of monster hunters. I did say that it was a fantasy, right? They continue in the family business, saving humanity from danger after danger, one monster at a time. Vampires and wendigos and ghosts and so much more. And as the seasons progress, the layers of the proverbial onion are peeled back and the brothers learn that much that they thought they knew about reality is so massively incomplete as to be simply wrong. The actors who play the brothers are, after 15 years in the roles themselves, 38 and 42 years old now, each married with three children, having grown into middle age, along with the characters they portray. In the last episode before the series finale, the brothers, Sam and Dean, Castiel, an angel who is their friend, and Jack, the innocent and complicated half-human son of Lucifer, who has also become family to them, these four together find themselves in a totally depopulated world. Now, to understand why, you have to understand 15 years of plot twists and the fictionalized storytelling of an author, sometimes called God and sometimes called Chuck, who wrote himself into his story. But however they got there, Sam, Dean, Castiel and Jack find themselves in the penultimate episode of the series, literally all alone in the universe. They are mourning lost friends, to be sure. They are experiencing isolation on an intolerable and unprecedented scale. No one has been this alone since Chuck wrote the story of Adam and Eve. The brothers' normal activities of saving humanity through bravado and self-sacrifice, these no longer seem possible when there is no one to rescue. And this final season of the series played out against the real-world backdrop of COVID-related lockdowns sheltering in place, distance working, quarantines, and isolation, a time when everyone has felt very alone at least part of the time. Back when Darwin's theory of evolution led many people to conclude that humanity was alone in the universe, no longer looked over by a god in control of things, but having to figure things out for themselves. For some, this was freeing. For others, it was a reason for despair and alienation. 
this was a very different sense of reality than their recent ancestors had experienced. As science fiction began presenting the popular culture with aliens coming to Earth or encountering humans out in space somewhere, these fictional humans were struck by the opposite realization. We are not alone in the universe, but the ones we encounter are not divine and sometimes not benign. Finding ways to coexist and at, in at least periodic peace is an all-consuming work. Modern human culture has entailed this tug of war between being alone, having to figure it all out for ourselves and finding ourselves in a cosmos or a continent or a nation teeming with competing worldviews and styles and personalities of individuals and cultures and peoples that sometimes seem fascinating and that we sometimes cast as dangerous. In our post-industrial Western reality, we together have not yet deeply understood the interplay between inherent worth and dignity on the one hand and the interdependence of all at every level of remove on the other. It is all either about me or it is all about a crowded universe in which we haven't truly figured out our place. Our second Advent candle today was the candle of peace, which, we can, which can only ever be achieved with both first and seventh principles, individual worth and interdependence guiding our path. We experience a seeming paradox of the macro and micro versions of our world as technology gives us more and more possibilities of connection, our experience grows in its sense of loneliness. People on average are ever less willing to be unconnected for an extended period of time, and yet there is no net increase in the sense of any real connection. In the series Supernatural, in contrast, Sam and Dean narratively shoulder responsibility for saving the world. They are engaged in protecting essentially everyone they encounter. They are deeply connected, and yet their lives are lives of solitude and sacrifice. They have chosen the life they live. They grow from the experience of chosen solitude. So when that final experience comes of being alone in an empty world, they are well prepared to forge ahead and do what has to be done for the good of a purpose beyond themselves, rather than lingering long in the loneliness. It is always a paradox one can be lonely in a crowd. One can experience solitude in engagement. Loneliness is the negative experience of not being connected or meaningfully engaged, while solitude is the positive experience of separation as part of an overall life pattern, whether or not one is surrounded by others. Loneliness, untreated, becomes a wound on the soul, but solitude chosen and connected to a greater good strengthens the heart and supports the mind in its quest for what is good. The season of Advent is prime time for both loneliness and solitude we can feel every unresolved pain more acutely as the days darken. In a normal year, we might bounce from party to concert to gathering to keep the loneliness at bay, or we can choose to settle in to the darkness with intention. 
with hope. Whether we engage in the common group activities or not, loneliness or solitude is the perennial question during Advent. And this year, in the middle of a surge in the pandemic with months of forced isolation and lessened possibilities for being together physically in our communities that support us, it is easier than ever for this aspect of Advent to get us down. We must choose our path and our attitude with intention and resolve if we would transform the loneliness our circumstances would dictate into a rich solitude from which we can pursue a greater purpose, something greater than ourself. And so, in the words of Mark Mosher de Wolf, with what benediction shall I leave you? This, in your life may you know the holy meaning, the mystery that breaks into every moment. May you live at peace with your world and at peace with yourself. And may the love of truth guide you every day. Amen and blessed be. Oh, no, no, peace, oh,